Let us begin. Okay. You now get the opening statement, then, like I tell everyone at the end in this room, it's a tough thing, but you get the last word. I get the last word. Okay. Uh, my name is Paul Linzer, and I am a professor of a number of different things at the University of Florida. I have actually six different graduate faculty appointments at the university. Among them is entomology, so that's insect biology for those who don't get those big science words. And I've lived here in St. John's County for 30 years. I am running for seat five of the Anastasia Mosquito Control District Commission. And I am doing that actually because I have been pushed by people involved in mosquito control here and throughout the state to consider this. I did so four years ago and lost by a narrow margin and did not run two years ago because I thought that first experience was enough. Um, but again, I've been uh, approached by the professionals uh, around the state to consider doing this again. And so I have, because of that pressure, elected to run for this chair. My perspective on this is that I have been a biologist working on mosquito, specifically on mosquito biology, for about 14 years. I've been a biologist for 35, 40 years. And the, what I've learned about mosquito biology in my research studies has given me what I think is a set of tools that are unique amongst the candidates, amongst the members of the current commission, in terms of really having an appreciation for what it takes to deal with mosquitoes. And I have a long sort of list of experiences in this community as a volunteer in a number of different organizations, among those with Boy Scouts of America, the Kiwanis Club, and I have been the president of the Gamble Rogers Folk Festival for about six or seven years and a, a member of that volunteer organization for about 15 years. That's a 501c3 nonprofit organization that produces music festivals for the purpose of um, providing funds to arts and education um, and music in the education system here. But back to the actual mosquito side of, of life, I have in my professional career managed several million dollars, and I don't really know the exact number, but probably seven to ten million dollars worth of federal funding and private funding for my research purposes um, over the 30 years I've lived here. And that has given me, uh, I think, a strong background in fiscal management. Running the Folk Festival also gives me um, a background in fiscal management when you don't have enough money to do things, how you get them done anyway. And, and we've, we've actually had a very successful year this year. And so the festival has been a, a lovely roller coaster ride that has taught me a lot about dealing with people and dealing with the financial side of a large organization. So I have a fiscal appreciation and my attitude towards fiscal issues is that in this sort of economic climate, choices, decisions have to be made very carefully and they have to be made on the basis of my, my buzzword in my campaign, which is balance. And balance is a tricky thing and it moves the point of balance between what the Mosquito Control District is, is here to do, which is to ensure the health and comfort of our citizenry with regard to what mosquitoes can do in your life, both from transmitting disease to the inconvenience of not being able to use your backyard. Um, and I think we need to balance what the citizens want and what the citizens, um, which they want for free, uh, and what we can really afford to do with what we have on the table at the moment. I think it's probably a, a bad time in history to make big leaps forward, but I think there are leaps forward that should be made in the future as the economy becomes a little more solid. Um, there are always issues that change the expenditure profile for a complex set of events such as are related to mosquito control and so that it's it's something in which the balance moves as technology evolves as problems evolve 
at this moment in time. We're following two really big rain events. And so as the record said this morning, we're going to have a heck of a lot of mosquitoes in the next few weeks. And so there's going to be a real press to control. And mosquito control has to be positioned and ready for that kind of uh, changing, almost emergency situation. Um, as far as there are a number of key issues on the table with mosquito control that have been in the press a lot in the last several years. Um, one has to do with whether or not they purchase uh, their own <coughs> flying devices, whether it be fixed wing airplanes or helicopters. Again, I think this year that's not a great idea. They have uh, come up with a, a very workable plan by outsourcing the flyover adulta sighting and um, uh, larva sighting that they do. It's an expensive way to do it. I think it is undeniable um, that you can save long-term money by owning your own whatever it may be. Helicopter would probably make the most sense here, but I'm not sure that that's uh, the best thing on the table. But I think for a while, um, we have to stick with what's in place now because the climate, the economic climate, is really pretty serious. I'm a member of the, the Florida Coordinating Council for Mosquito Control. In fact, yesterday we had our quarterly meeting, which is a, an appointed position by the lieutenant governor. And so I'm very well connected to the mosquito concerns around the entire state of Florida. Uh, and I am very well connected to mosquito control districts all over the state. And, and I can tell you that Anastasia Mosquito Control District is doing a pretty good job. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm not hypercritical of anything they're doing, but again, the fiscal question is fairly central right now. And I think there's, it's a time to be careful and prudent. They are in a situation now, if you look at their current budget picture, they have been, because of the economic downturn, they have been very conservative for the last several years and actually working in the negative uh, as opposed to raising taxes, which as a special district they have the authority to do that. Uh, the commission has the authority to do that and they have not raised taxes uh, in recent years. So each year the budget has actually gone into their nest egg, which was $5 million several years ago, now it's down to four point something million dollars. And, and that is obviously something that can't go on forever. Uh, and so as they seek, as the commission seeks, and the mosquito control district staff seek ways to reduce or make their expenses more efficient, um, there inevitably will come a time when something has to be done about this negative expenditure every year. They are still a relatively small budget compared to some of the mosquito control districts in the state, but our mosquito control pressure is probably not as robust as in a lot of South Florida. So it makes sense. The long and the short of it is, is that I bring to the table uh, connectivity and mosquito control that is not paralleled by anyone else on the commission or anyone running on the commission. I bring to the table experience in actual the biology of mosquitoes um, that is unique. Uh, no one in this community in St. Johns County has the kind of background in mosquito biology that, that I do. I have a, a fairly substantial history in managing budgets and uh, fairly large budgets from time to time. I have a long history of working in the community with others to bring about sometimes impossible tasks and, and have succeeded in some cases, in others they've been impossible. Um, and I, I think that if the voters will do their homework and will actually investigate me and the candidates, uh, the other candidates for this same position, um, and they don't uh, attack this on a purely political basis or a politically or a party based decision making process that I, I think I, I stand a good chance of actually bringing my credentials, my experience, my point of view to the, the commission and hopefully that will be certainly be my plan for that to be a positive.
You mentioned leaps forward, that, uh, that uh, those are things that will be challenging uh, the Mosquito Control District in the future. What leaps forward? Your work leaps forward. Well, one of the, the big things on the table for many years now has been the notion of consolidating. Right now, the, the Mosquito Control District operates three locations from whence they uh, distribute their service. And the, the main one here in town is 40 some years old or so. And, and so there has been a, a back and forth battle over whether or not to build a centralized location. And they own property, as I'm sure you're all aware, out on, off of Route 16 by I-95, which would take the, the location to sort of, the, sort of the middle of the county. Um, and depending on who you talk to, that's a good or a bad thing. And I've, I've been doing a lot of investigation over the last four years on whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. I think in the long term, if the economy was 2006 economy, uh, it would probably be a smart thing to do. Um, it also opens the door for creating uh, a helipad if they, in fact, we, in fact, decide that a helicopter is the best way for them to go for their aerial um, control strategies. There are also mosquito control logistics in the state that say that doing that wasn't the greatest thing that they ever did because some have done the same kind of consolidation and having the different locations gives um, some opportunity for immediacy to an attack on problems that happen in just in Ponte Vedra or in Hastings or whatever. So I, I am not convinced um, one way or the other as to the best path, I think economically right now it's a bad time. I think um, because of the, the financial realities that making a decision to contract an engineer, a construction firm to get involved in designing and building something out there this year is not a good idea and, and I, I will stand on that. But I am not going to close my mind and say that that's not something that would be a good idea in the future. I mean, I've had people from the Mosquito Control District give me two sides of that. And so it's not a done deal. I've, I've read the financial cost um, analysis. The, I can't remember the phrase now. The, yeah, anyway, the, the analysis on what that would save in the long term. And it is a long term benefit to do that. Uh, and I think that the, the numbers are pretty solid that long term, 10 years. We're thinking short term now, and I think a lot of aspects of the common are thinking short term now, you know, hold. But as I said, you know, they're working in the negative each year. So they're spending several hundred thousand dollars out of their nest egg each year. So if that goes on for 10 years, well, it can't go on for 10 years. They don't have that big a nest egg. And so at some point in the future, either there's going to have to be a, a dramatic reduction in the expenditures that they budget each year, or there will have to be an, an, an income increase. And, and nobody wants to vote for an income increase now. Bad politics. Uh, there are also, you know, there are, there are also game-changing things in mosquito biology and mosquito uh, pesticide development that are always on the table. that are always being um, pursued. Right now, there's not something that's going to pop up in the next year that is going to make a big difference in how we control mosquitoes. But I can tell you from my connectivity internationally to the kinds of research that are going on in mosquito control um, that in five years, there may very well be a big game changer to how we do this. Um, not simple, but, but there are maybe economically really solid ways coming into the, to the game that, that I, you know, is sort of beyond me to, to give you the, the details. And, and, and I, you know, and I, you can't promise anything. One of the things that in this field is um, never ending is that pesticides like antibiotics lose efficacy over time because of the populations of animals that you're controlling evolve. Uh, and you select for ones that are very resistant. And so, the number of regis registered pesticides out there is actually relatively few, and there are actually relatively few gene tar targets for those pesticides. There's only a 
couple of things in the nervous system that most of them work on, not all of them, but most of them work on, except for the larvicides like BTI. And so there's a never-ending effort worldwide, as there is in pharmaceuticals for making antibiotics, to come up with new targets, which is my business, which is part of what I do as well. New genes that are the target for these <coughs> pesticide strategies, and whole new strategies that are based on sort of genetic manipulations and, and other fun things that we really don't want to go into because it would, I'd be here till tomorrow. But in any event, there, and I don't mean that in any kind of a condescending way. It is very, it's science that is, you know, right up at the very top of what I can comprehend and, and try to keep up with. I mean, there is an effort right now to actually release transgenic mosquitoes in the Keys. So as you probably, you may or may not be aware, there was a dengue uh, sort of outbreak a couple of years ago down there. And one of uh, the approaches that has been suggested, and it's, it's a political hot potato, is to re reduce, uh, release a whole lot of, of genetically modified mosquitoes that will reduce the, the mating potential of the indigenous population to bring the numbers down. But the dengue um, issue kind of cured itself and kind of died out last year. Um, but it's always there waiting to happen. It's waiting to happen here, too. I mean, if, if our economy were to, to sail low enough that people actually opened their windows and took the screens off the windows, you would see it happen here. Um, it's, it's simple biology, you know, it just would happen. But we have air conditioning, we have windows with screens, and, and so the propensity for the pool of sick people to spread into a larger community is really negated by just our lifestyle. But back to the pesticides, there, is a, there are a number of things that are always being developed, but the registering new pesticides is a horrifically expensive thing to do. And so the, there are actually relatively few companies that are willing to, to go in that direction. You hear of new products every year, but they're the same pesticides that are either delivered differently or packaged with something else a little differently. They get a new name, you know, a new logo, a new registered trademark. Um, but there, you know, there's basically just a, f a few that are out there. But there are, I can tell you from, you know, behind the scenes that there are things in the offing that can make a change. And you need someone, whether it be me or Dr. Shu or somebody else, who's really in touch with what's happening to be ready to jump on something like that when it really gets registered and it's available to us. I don't think the transgenic mosquito business is going to become available to us in my lifetime. Okay. What about the, the threat that some have uh, said about the 450 of people coming from around the world that they will be uh, uh, potentially bringing with them uh, diseases that could be carried by mosquitoes and be a threat? Is that, do you see that as an issue? Well, it's the, the worldwide issue with um, vector-borne diseases, so that's our catchphrase. Vectors can be any kind of an insect, but mosquitoes are the primary one. The worldwide issue is it's a small world, and people do travel a lot. And so if one perceives the 450th as attracting people from parts of the world where things like dengue and malaria are rampant, then it's inevitable. I mean, people will, we don't have any kind of screening, screening process on international flights coming into the United States. Other, some other countries do, but we don't have any screening process. So when people come in, they can be sick. You know, the, the thing with vector-borne diseases is that you always have to have a reservoir of sick people or animals that the mosquitoes can then feed on and then transmit the disease to a secondary target. And so you have, to, you have to fulfill all of those criteria. It is possible, it's why we had a case of malaria in Jacksonville last year. Somebody got it somewhere else or was living in a, uh, South America, I think, and came up with malaria and visited somebody and got bitten and somebody next door got bitten by that same female mosquito a few days mm -hmm. later. So that's always a possibility. The 450th, we don't have any way to control who comes and goes. CDC has monitoring systems for you know, people in hospitals are supposed to report any weird diseases, anything that's out of the norm. And if something like malaria or dengue showed up in our community, you would presume that within, you know, it's not going to be a day, but within a week, we would know that. 
Um, and but I think I think in reality, because most of the people who will be traveling are affluent, that that's actually a fairly minor concern. Mm. Okay. Affluent people Boy. tend not to have these diseases. Boy. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just need to switch this camera. Okay, okay. fine. Yeah. The picture that's on the it ultrasound. Was. That's the baby there. It was the register. <laughs> We're back in business. Sorry for the back All right. We'll grab right. the uh, charger on the next go around. All right. All right. Thanks, Peter. I think we're back in your court now. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, let me ask about uh, are you familiar with the equipment that's housed and how much of it and what's your ideas about the adequacy of the equipment and well, the, you know, that's not enough? Um, it's actually in their fiscal plan for 2012-13, um, they plan to buy a few replacement pieces because, I mean, that you can imagine this is a, uh, the, the kind of equipment, the spray, spraying equipment that they use, which creates these almost nano drop size um, droplets of pesticides, they're, they're pretty fine too. And, you know, it's like anything, like a car, I mean, it wears out. And you can replace bits and pieces of it, which is what they typically do. They're planning to replace, I think, one or two trucks, because trucks certainly wear out, and and then some of the spray equipment, but not a lot. What they have, I think, is I mean, your citizens here, you tell me, are they doing an adequate job? And that's the question. So when I when I campaigned the last time, I asked people point blank, do you think they're doing an adequate job for you, for your neighborhood? And most people said, yeah, they thought they were. And that's the bottom line, is who, what do the, how do the citizens feel about what's going on? You know, there are always extremes. There are dipoles. There are the people who do not want any kind of pesticide in their environment under any circumstances. And I live in a neighborhood where we, we gravitate towards that position. And then there are people who, I don't care what you put in my air, I don't want those damn mosquitoes biting me. We can erase that damn. Anyway, uh, and 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 they and they they are sort of at odds with each other all the time, and and as I said, you got to be here, you got to be in the middle between those two extremes, and play. You have to play the statistical game, and you know, as a scientist, I play the statistics all the time, and you have to find the median position or the mean position somehow, and that's it's tricky. But as far as their equipment is concerned, what they have now is, is up to the job. It changes all the time. So I go to the Florida Mosquito Control Association meeting and the American Mosquito Control Association every other year or so, and I know that that equipment is evolving. I know that Anastasia has actually um, analyzed some new equipment from a company in China, and that is actually very attractive because of its price and its lightweight uh, and it seems to be very robust, and so I know they did some test testing for this company this past year, and I, my impression is that the results were pretty good. Now, whether or not they're going to go right out and buy a bunch of their backpacks and a bunch of their truck sprayers, I'm not sure that they, they have the, the funds to do that. But one thing that is, uh, I think, an advantage to Anastasia is that the director is actually a scientist, is a real scientist, and he is really in touch with the the community of scientists that pursue these things at a level that is that exceeds most mosquito control directors. I mean, most people are not really dedicated scientists in their training and their background. Um, and Dr. Shu is uh, is pretty comprehensive in what he tries to do. You can tell I, I like him. Um, I can't understand him, but but he does a very Good job, and actually, I've actually done some proofing for some of his writing. Um, but he's done a very good job from a scientific perspective of trying to stay up with what's going on. Testing, they had a program last year or the year before where they did a bunch of testing on barrier spraying. So there is a there is a, a method for controlling what's happening here by spraying those trees over there because during the daytime. Uh, a lot of the mosquito species, not all, we have something like 48 species in our county, they rest in these trees. And so if you put a pesticide that is uh, you know, safe to the trees, relatively safe to all the other organisms, into those barrier plants, you can actually set up a fairly effective, and they did some, 
some research, I think, out at the high school, at the, at the amphitheater, a number of other places uh, up in Ponte Vedra, and they got some, you know, fairly good results. Nothing's ever 100%. If you knock down mosquitoes by 60 or 70%, you're doing pretty well. Or if you barrier them from your house by 60 or 70%, you're doing well. The guy sitting on the back porch getting bitten by a mosquito doesn't, doesn't necessarily buy that. He wants 100%, but we, you know, that's, that's not practical without killing lots of things out there. With, with your familiarity with the control district, do you see any immediate needs uh, that are, uh, critical is probably an overstatement, but uh, immediate need would be a better description? No, I don't. I, I think that uh, it's, it's been functioning fairly well for a uh, substantial length of time. I think there are economic issues on the not too distant future because of the fact that they've had their operating the red for the last few years. Um, if our economy doesn't rebound um, and you know the, the tax dollars go up because the assessments go up as opposed to you know the actual value of homes goes up, um, something will have to happen and it'll either be I mean human beings are the most expensive thing. I'm also a very human oriented guy, I have to tell you. I am you know I've worked for the state of Florida for 30 years and we just we don't get much. <laughs> and so you know, I, if I were to prioritize where money should go in the future, I would have to put in that top five list, you know, a real assessment of when the last time that they got a cost of living raise. When was that and was it really substantial? And, and if it wasn't, I mean, that has to go in there because these people, um, it's a turnover market. You know, if, you're, if you can't make a living wage of what you're doing, and what they do is something that you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it, you know. I wouldn't do it um, <laughs> because I mean it's it's an exposure issue, and and they're they are risking their health and well-being for our health and well-being, and so I think that they're they're a top priority in terms of what you need to do with your tax dollars when when it's okay. It isn't okay now. You know, we just all have to admit the reality. It isn't okay to to expand expenditures in in this current climate. Um, and one can only hope it will get better. If it doesn't get better, it's going to have to come out of services. And, and by coming out of services, it will probably mean people, and will re be reduced, reduced coverage of the uh, requests for service that are out there now. And so, you know, it's, it's a very poss possible reality that if our economy doesn't bound back in the next four or five years, um, that you can expect the Anastasia Mosquito Control District to continue whittling away at what they're able to do. They don't waste money. I have looked at their budgets for several years. And, you know, everybody says there's waste, uh, and there is always waste, but are they, I think they work pretty uh, stridently to, to spend the dollars wisely, and, and they don't get paid a whole lot. Mark, you got some questions? Um, well, you've mentioned operating in the red and, you know, not having enough money. And so I'm sitting here thinking about $4 million in mm -hmm. reserves. And is there or has there ever been a plan developed on how much we need in reserves and how we futuristically predict right. how to use other reserves mm. rather than just saying, oh well, we've got a crisis this year, so we need 200,000 here, mm. 200,000 there, based on your example. Yeah, well, mosquito control is, is you can plan your budget, and they do, mm -hmm. um, in advance, but you can't plan the weather, right. so you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So last year was actually a pretty good year, it was a dry mm -hmm. summer. Um, and so the mosquito control pressure on them was fairly, it wasn't minimal, but it was less than it's going to be next week. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was pretty pretty low. But even so, they are, because of lots of things going on, you're probably aware of the, I've got to be aware of the fact that the county commissioners wanted to take over, uh, and which... I think it's just patently a bad idea. It's a very bad idea to 
the county commissioners have an awful lot on their plate and to ask them to now become experts in uh, this very technical field is ludicrous and uh, and and you know and there are also political underpinnings about that four million dollars and really what they wanted to you know, who knows but I think it's a bad idea um, I mean I'm in contact with uh, several other special districts which is what the Anastasia is and that seems to be in the best benefit of the citizenry to have that under its own control but in any event uh, back to operating in the red um, they have is there a long-term plan for that money yeah there was a long-term plan for that money and the reason they accumulated that over the last 15 years or so was this notion of building a centralized facility mm -hmm. and so they had a plan that was you know going stage wise in that direction until 2008 when everything went down the toilet and so um, wisely the commission has kind of put the hold on that and we're going and has avoided raising taxes even though the income has decreased because the assessments or the what do you call that the assessments the when you evaluate it up north group. they call it the grand list and down here they call it the praise list whatever but since that number has come down uh, they, their income has come down but they have not so there's four million dollars plus still in this kitty which was initially accumulated during kind of you know the bus the the, the bear the, the the bull 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 the fat period when everybody was buying houses <laughs> that they couldn't afford and you know we're getting mortgage bull. rates that you know it, it was a lot of bull uh, <laughs> what was the logic there who who didn't see that anyway um, during that period they were able to accumulate this excess for the purpose of becoming uh, a, a fully balanced mature facility as compared to other facilities in the state of this size which includes an, uh, you know an indigenous aerial plan you know some kind of, of aerial attack that they own and operate and it is honestly it is cheaper to own your own car than it is to rent a car mm -hmm. or to lease a car yeah. and it is cheaper to own your own helicopter than it is to rent a service um, and then, of course, there was the, and the plan for the new building out there is $2 million-ish. And so that's, you know, how that nest egg was grown or the intention of that nest egg. But that's not the only intention. There is also this potential crisis is always waiting. It's always out there. We may have a crisis this summer. If we have a lot of this kind of weather, we're going to have a crisis situation. If we have a lot of birds with West Nile virus around and we've had a number of sentinel chickens show up already this year. It's not a huge number, it's not a panic, anything to panic about, but that can happen. And, and if you've got to be more aggressive about mosquito control, every time you have to go out there it's another five hundred or fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars. You know, so every time you, you have to hit so this is a rainy day fund and an emergency yes, fund absolutely. and four absolutely. million dollars is justified for Absolutely. an operation that we have at this size. Yes. And if you remember, there was also concern about the kind of building the mosquito control wanted mm -hmm. because at the time we had mosquito control members telling us we want to be a place where others can come for research mm -hmm. and conferences. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it was kind of elevating a notion mm. and all and we want here is kill the mosquitoes and <laughs> kill them good. You know. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that was a. That, no, that's right. A mm. Former publisher made that point several times. That they want a Cadillac when all they need is a Rambler. Well, you know, it's <laughs> just one Rambler. Cadillac. I saw a Rambler yesterday. That's yeah. why that came up. Because I saw a Rambler on up being towed at the Flying J. I'm well, sorry. I can appreciate <laughs> the need for a rainy day mm -hmm. fund. Of just you know, at what point can do you say? Okay, we have four million in reserves. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be operating in the red. So, somewhere we have to start balancing. Right. And, and we've got a point one three two five mil mm -hmm. uh, assessment right now. Mm -hmm. So. I'll take your word for that number. That's well, a long number to memorize. Okay. I'd have to look it up on that. Okay. Well, I was yeah, looking up is, on my tax bill yeah, last night. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, where the plan is. Where. Or maybe, well, there, there is a 10-year plan. 
you know, and the, and the 10 year plan is, you know, it's still stamped. It's been in place for like three, three or four years actually. Mm -hmm. Now it's still stamped as a draft. So maybe and, it needs, yeah, uh, go ahead, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, it's still called a draft 10 year plan and literally the change in the economy in 2008 made half of what was in there nonsensical. You know, it's just it's very difficult to live up to those kinds of expectations when the you know, the income is going down, and so it's it's how much do they need as a buffer? If you're not going to do any program expansion, if you're not going to move into you know the educational side of life, which they I think their education person just resigned recently, so they have to hire either hire a new one or quit doing that. But you know, in reality, in mosquito control, you've got to do lots of things. You can't just right. you can't just spray. You have to teach the people not to leave that freaking bird bath full of water for a week. Yeah. You've got to change it every five days, uh, or not have one, or put a pump in it so it moves, or whatever. But you know, there's all of that kind of stuff is very valuable. And in all of the various meetings that I've been to in my 15 year history with this, 14 year history with this, it's clear that every one of those things incrementally have an impact. I cannot give you dollars and cents on the value of the educational program, but I can tell you that it's valuable. So, so in terms of having a four million dollar, could it be cut to two million dollars for, you know, if, if you're only looking at the next three years? Probably. Um, if, you're only, if you're looking at ten years and you're not expecting in ten years for that four million dollars to grow, I think you need four million dollars. Um, and Right now, I think it's almost impossible to know what's going to happen in the next two years. So they they really have to operate on a year to year basis, right. and whether or not they get to the point where they can live up to their five year plan, ten year plan, which includes building and buying a helicopter, it just it depends on how uh, how many tourists come to town and buy new houses. Well, I understand all of that, but if you've got a ten year plan that's still draft, stands it's still, draft, it would right. seem to me. It's the time commission to, needs to really sit down yeah. and revise the plan. Or, yeah. you know, well, I think, I think it is, but you can, you can see in any kind of, we do 10-year plans at the Whitney Lab too. We do 10-year mm -hmm. plans in all the departments that I'm associated with on campus. Um, the Folk Vessel doesn't do 10-year plans. We do two-year plans <laughs> as far as we can dream. Um, but every time you do that, you know, there is an inevitable high percentage of your plan is pie in the sky, is a guess. Of course. Because you don't know what the winds are going to blow in. You don't know if a hurricane's going to come in and leave us physically devastated and with water everywhere. You know, if that happens, as it did down in New Orleans, yeah. mosquito control issues down in, in New Orleans went you know, out the window for a fairly long period of time. So there was disease issues and there was a lot of inconvenience all around the, the basin yeah. down there when Katrina came through. So if that happens here, that $4 million is going to get eaten up in about two years. I understand that, but you've yeah. got a 10-year plan, yeah. still stamped draft. Yeah. Somebody, don't you think, somebody I needs do. to be revising? I do, I do. To and match if, the economy and, and so I will, I will, I will say here as a, um, an issue, as a campaign issue, that if I get elected, I will make sure that that gets evaluated and either moved out of the draft status or certainly moved into something that's more topical for the immediate circumstances that we're all facing. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for pulling that out of me. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. And what did you have anything? All right, you get the last word. Wow. Like I said, that's a tough thing to get in this room. The last word. Well, um, last word. I I think there are important things in the offing that are not only economic, but there are lots of issues coming onto the table with regard to the character and quality of mosquito control and I think it's important to have people who are knowledgeable in more than just fiscal matters uh, on the commission. Um, as I stated early on and throughout this little discussion we've had, uh, my background is, and I don't mean this as a, a boast, but it's, it's unique. It's unique to St. John's County. There is no one else in this county who has 
a background such as I do in mosquito biology. And, and I would like to put that on the table for the citizenry of St. John's County as a smart thing to do, as to have someone who is credentialed as I am involved in making these decisions that are going to be very, very touchy and very important to view the central balance at all times. What is the balance between the dipoles? Where is the balance position? And that's going to change. And I hope that the, all the experiences, I think, I would argue that the experiences that I've had in life give me um, the tools to actually help guide that balance point. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Paul, thank you.